Is the United States of America pinpointed in the book of Revelation? You'll find out on His Voice today. Welcome to another His Voice Today with Steve Wolberg. Welcome to His Voice Today. My topic is a controversial one. It's the place of America in Bible prophecy. I remember very uh, clearly I was in Northern California in the summer of 2007 and I received a very unusual email. The subject line said, Declassified. And as I read the body, uh, it was an invitation from the chaplain's office of the United States Pentagon inviting me to come to the Pentagon and to share my views on prophecy. Um, I said a, a prayer and made a quick decision that yes, I would come because how many opportunities do you have to go and uh, share in front of the military leadership of the most powerful nation in the world about your views of prophecy. And so I did it, uh, and it was quite an experience for me. Uh, I picked the role of American prophecy. I attempted to prove from Scripture that, yes, America does have a, a place in God's prophetic word. There was quite a crowd of uh, military brass in front of me that listened with uh, with their eyes and their ears uh, and their hearts. And as I went down through my points, uh, point by point, I could tell that they were quite shocked at the information. When it was all over, I, um, I attempted to prove the unthinkable. And that is that this nation, which has uh, stood for so long for religious freedom and the principles of, uh, of truth and righteousness, and not using force in matters of religion, that in the final remnants of time, this country would deny its own principles of freedom and it would eventually become a tyrant and do, uh, again, the unthinkable, which is prophetically to actually be involved in the enforcement of the mark of the beast. Uh, when the meeting was over, the chaplain, his name is Chapl Chaplain William Broom, he was the one that invited me. He presented me with a, a coin from the chaplain's office. He gave me uh, a letter from the Department of the Army thanking me for coming. And then he actually presented me with this flag, which was very memorable to me, a flag that was flown in my honor over the Pentagon itself on that same day. And I have the privilege right now of sharing with you the same information that I shared with them in 2007, and you be the judge. And God will be the judge whether America is truly mentioned in his prophetic book. So let's go to Revelation chapter 13, and let's look at verse 11. This is the main text I want to focus on. Revelation 13, 11, it's a very mysterious verse. A lot of different views about it that are current in the prophecy-minded world, but here we have what God says. Revelation 13, 11, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. What is this verse all about? A lot of speculation in the religious world, all kinds of ideas that are floating around uh, as to what prophecy actually means and, and who this beast is. But the first thing we need to establish is what is a beast anyway in prophecy? That's the, uh, the big foundational question. When Revelation talks about a beast coming up, what is a beast? Is a beast a big computer? Some people think uh, the beast is going to be a big uh, supercomputer in Belgium. But that idea is just as true, as a, just as phony as a $3 bill. It's not in the Bible. So, so how do we know what is a beast anyway? Uh, the key to that question is found in another Old Testament book, which is in Daniel chapter 7. When you compare Daniel 7 with Revelation 13, it's very obvious that both chapters go together like a lock and a key. They fit together perfectly. Revelation 13 talks about a lion, a bear, a leopard, a dragon-like beast, ten horns, uh, a mouth speaking great things, and war on the saints. The exact same things are described in Daniel chapter 7. Same beasts, same war, same mouth, same thing. And most scholars recognize this, that the two chapters go right together. Daniel 7, verses 3 to 7, describe four great beasts. The first was like a lion, then there's a bear, then there's a leopard, and then there's a fourth beast, a dragon-like beast with ten horns. Now again, the question is, what is a beast in prophecy? 
Uh, I don't believe God wants me to be like a magician who pulls an interpretation out of my hat. We have to have something more solid than that. And we do, because the answer to the question is found in verse 23. Here we have an angel talking to Daniel in his dream. Daniel had this dream, and in verse 23, thus he said, this is what the angel told Daniel in his dream, that the fourth beast would be the fourth, not the fourth computer, but the fourth kingdom upon the earth. So the fourth beast is the fourth kingdom, and obviously if that's true, which it is, then the third beast would be the third kingdom, the second beast would be the second kingdom, and the first beast would be the first kingdom. In other words, a beast in Daniel 7, which parallels Revelation 13, represents uh, not a man and not a computer, but a great nation. And if you pick up a Bible commentary uh, in a Christian bookstore, if you go online and do Bible studies about Daniel 7, uh, it's pretty obvious, and I think about 98% of all scholars who have studied Daniel 7 would agree that the four beasts, the lion, the bear, the leopard, and the dragon-like beast with ten horns, that they represent the great nations of ancient Babylon, followed by Persia, followed by Greece, followed by the, um, the powerful Roman Empire. These four beasts, these four nations would rise and fall on the stage of human history. These are simple facts from Daniel 7 and from history. Now, in that light, let's go back to Revelation chapter 13 and let's relook at verse 11. 1311, the Bible says, John looked into the future and he wrote, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. So, uh, fact number one. A beast in Revelation 13, which perfectly parallels Daniel 7, does not represent a man, it does not represent a computer, it represents, as the angel said, a great nation or a great kingdom upon the earth. So we know that, that this is talking about a great, a great nation. Now, if we keep going, the text also says that he would be coming up. Verse 11 says this great nation would come up. Now when does he come up? Does he come up way back in ancient history in the time of Babylon, Persia, Greece, or Rome, or does he, does he come up uh, down near the closing of Earth's history? Well, we can find the answer to that without speculation by looking at verse 16. Verse 16 says that eventually this same beast would cause all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Now let me ask you, when does the mark of the beast come? Does the mark of the beast come in ancient history or does it come down near the end of time? The answer is obvious. The mark of the beast is something that prophecy predicts would take place in the closing moments of human history. And the mark of the beast would be enforced by this beast in Revelation 13, 11. So when the scripture says that he's coming up, we know that uh, relatively speaking as far as the vast expanse of human history, that this beast or nation would rise up, it would come up into power somewhere down near the end of time. Now, another clue as to who this is, is the scripture says that he would come out of a certain location. He would come up out of the earth. Revelation 13, 11, the beast comes out of the earth. Now, significantly, in Daniel 7, the four beasts that Daniel saw in his dream, the lion, the bear, the leopard, and the dragon-like beast, they all came up, up from the sea. That's what Daniel 7 verse 3 says, that the four beasts come out of the sea. But the beast in Revelation 13, 11 comes from a different location out of the earth. Now what does the sea or the water represent? That will give us a clue to what the earth represents. If you compare these scriptures with Revelation 17, verse 15, Revelation 17 talks about a, a harlot named Babylon who sits upon a beast, and the beast is sitting upon the waters. And in Revelation 17, verse 15, and I'll read the verse to you so you know that I'm not speculating, verse 15 says, here's an angel again talking to John now instead of Daniel, he said to me that the waters which you saw where the whore is sitting are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So water in prophecy 
represents lots and lots of people, nations and tongues. And it's a fact, it's a historical fact, that the nations of Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, that they, they grew up out of the sea of the multitudes of people in Europe and the Middle East. But the beast in Revelation, chapter 13, verse 11, comes from a different place. 13.11 says, I beheld another beast or nation coming up out of the earth. Now, if the water represents uh, multitudes of people, nations, tongues, uh, all kinds of different nations, then what about the earth? The earth would then represent an area that is uh, much more sparsely populated, an area that does not have a lot of nations, a lot of people. I mean, there were some here uh, when America got started, but uh, relatively speaking, compared to the rising of Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, the land that America got started on was a wilderness area. So that's another clue to the text. Now, if we go back to chapter 13 and look at verse 11, let's keep putting the pieces together. I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had, he had two horns, two horns like a lamb. Now, what, what can we say about these horns? Two horns, as part of this nation, would represent a division of power within its governmental structure. And significantly, when Revelation 13, 11 describes these two horns, these horns do not have crowns on them. There's actually two beasts in Revelation 13. There's the first beast in verses 1 to 10 and the second beast in verse 11 that enforces the mark of the first beast. And in verse, if you go back to chapter 13, verse 1, it describes the first beast. And the first beast has seven heads and ten horns. And verse 1 says upon his horns he would have ten crowns. Crowns represent kingly power. So the first beast is connected to kings, but the second beast would only have two horns instead of ten, and these two horns are crownless horns. They have no crowns, which would represent that the government of this nation, which comes up out of the earth down near the end of time, would uh, not have a king that would rule over it. This would be a kingless nation. So that's another clue. Now let's keep going. It also says in verse, thir verse 11 that this beast would have two horns representing a division of power without a king, two horns like a lamb, like a lamb. Now a lamb in Revelation and throughout the Bible represents Jesus Christ. Now I do not believe that this beast is Jesus, but it has certain lamb-like principles uh, and two horns like a lamb, a lamb is also a baby sheep. So at some point, this nation would be a new nation. It would be like a baby nation that would be rising up, and it would have two horns like a lamb, two horns that are reflective somewhere of the teachings of Jesus Christ. Uh, we don't have time to read all the verses right now, but in Matthew chapter 22, there's a fascinating account where Jesus was confronted by the Pharisees. And as the Pharisees challenged him and tried to trap him, they, they um, tried to trick him, they didn't realize they were talking to a man that had a, a, an IQ of a billion. He can't outwit the Son of God. Jesus finally said, show me a penny. And they gave him a penny, and he looked at the penny, and he said, whose image and superscription is on this penny? And uh, they said, Caesar's. They had asked him first. They said, uh, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? And they thought that they, they had him licked. They thought if he said, uh, no, don't pay taxes to Caesar, they would complain to the Roman government and Jesus would be accused of sedition against Caesar. They thought that if he said, yes, you should pay taxes to Caesar, then they would go to the Jews and they would say, how can you say that this is your Messiah? He's loyal to the, to the Roman government. He says that we should pay our taxes. So they thought that whatever answer he gave, that they had him. But Jesus was much smarter than they were. And so he said, show me a penny. And he said, whose face is on the penny? And they said, it's Caesar's. And then in verse 21, Jesus gave a marvelous response that they had no answer for. They said to him, it's Caesar's image on the coin. And then Jesus said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things which are Caesar's and to God the things which are God's. In other words, uh, Jesus said, 
Caesar's things are over here and God's things are over here. Yes, you should pay taxes because you need to give the things of Caesar to Caesar, representing the government, but you give the things that belong to God to God. And they were stumped, they walked away, they had nothing to say. And here we have Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, giving a principle. And the principle is that the things of Caesar and the things of God are not the same. Jesus is here separating government and the things of government from religion. And amazingly, that principle is what was eventually incorporated into the Constitution of the new nation of the United States of America, into the Bill of Rights, which, uh, which states that Congress shall not make a law to establish religion or to prohibit the free exercise thereof. That's called the, uh, the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights. And the scripture says in Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, that this new nation coming up out of the earth down near the end of time, verse 11 tells us that he would have two horns like a lamb. It was Jesus that separated government from religion, and this nation has done the same thing. The book of Revelation contains an amazing prophecy about the United States. What role will America play in the final days of Earth's history? Find out about this astonishing prediction and more in the book America in Prophecy. Order America in Prophecy for only $5.95. To order, call 1-800-782-4253. Order online at whitehorsemedia.com or you can write to White Horse Media, P.O. Box 1139, Newport, Washington, 99156. Now, let's go on to the last part of the verse. Verse 11, at the very end, says that eventually the lamb-like mild principles of freedom that are professed by this nation would eventually break down and he would speak as a dragon. Two horns like a lamb, but he would eventually speak like a dragon. And when you keep reading, we know what this means because verse 16 tells us that he would cause, and the word cause means force. Cause has to do with compulsion and the denial of freedom. He would cause all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So at the final moments of time, the lamb-like profession breaks down, and this nation would speak as a dragon and use force, and he would cause, and when the text says he would cause all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, that also gives us a clue, and it tells us that this nation would eventually become a superpower capable of enforcing something upon the entire world. He would cause all to get the mark. And that's what the Bible says, that this power would eventually resort to the degrading principle of force, and he would be involved, uh, tragically, in the enforcement of the mark of the beast. Now, let's put these pieces together. And this is what I did at the Pentagon at the prayer breakfast. Uh, I had this crowd in front of me. I had a screen. I had my computer. I kept pushing my button buttons. I kept putting these points up on the screen one by one. And let me just summarize what I shared in 2007, and I'll share it with you. Let's just look at the evidence. Revelation 13.11 tells us John wrote... I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he would eventually speak as a dragon. Let's put the facts together. We know from Daniel 7, without speculation or, or wild and crazy ideas, and there's a lot of them out there these days. I remember uh, Harold Camping, the, the, the minister with American Family Radio, he predicted that Jesus Christ would come, that the rapture would take place on, first it was May 21, 2011, that didn't happen. Then he revised his opinion to October 21, uh, 2011, and that didn't happen. And finally, he just faded off into obscurity uh, as, a, as a false teacher because his predictions didn't happen. And there's all kinds of wild 
predictions and interpretations about prophecy today, what's going to happen, what, what does the scripture really mean. So let's just try to put away you know, some wild ideas and let's just look at the biblical facts. Revelation 13, 11 talks about a beast. Uh, and according to the Bible, what is a beast? The angel said in Daniel 7, 23, the fourth beast would be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. That's a nail in a sure place, a golden nail. So we know that this beast would represent a great nation. Uh, the Bible says that he would be coming up. Coming up. Now, when does he come up? He doesn't come up in ancient history. He comes up down near the end of time because in verse 16, he's involved with the tragic enforcement of the mark of the beast. So we have a nation rising up down near the end of time, and he becomes a key player at the end of time. Verse 11 also says that the location of his rise would be out of the earth. Uh, in Daniel 7, the beasts came out of the sea. The nations of Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome rose up out of the midst of the peoples and nations of Europe and the Middle East. But the second beast in Revelation 13, 11 would come out of a different area. He would come out of the earth or a wilderness area where there's not as many people. So that's another solid fact. He would have two horns representing a division of power. Those two horns would not have crowns representing kings, that this nation's uh, governmental structure would not be a monarchy. It would be a different kind of government uh, where the leadership would be elected instead of, uh, instead of uh, inheriting or just passing on rulership like a monarchy. Two horns representing a division of power, and those horns would be like a lamb, a lamb is a, is a new animal, it's a baby animal, a baby sheep, uh, showing that this nation would have, have new features and it would have Christ-like features because the lamb ultimately in Revelation is a symbol of Jesus Christ. And we also know that Jesus, when he was here and when he was challenged by the religious leaders, he said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. Jesus separated the things of Caesar or government from the things of religion. This is the principle of the lamb, and the prophecy says that this nation would have two horns like a lamb, representing uh, the principles of Jesus Christ. And then the prophecy says, sadly, tragically, that eventually, in the final moments of time, uh, the profession of freedom, the mildness of its characteristics, would eventually disintegrate and it would do the unthinkable. It would be involved in the use of force. Revelation 13, 11 said he would speak as a dragon. He would use compulsion. Verse 16 and 17 says that he would cause, again, using force. He would cause all, showing that he's a superpower, he's become a superpower, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead, and that nobody might buy or sell in the final moments of human history unless they go along with the mark. Now, let me ask you, how many nations are there that fit this prophetic prophecy, this description that we find in Revelation? How many nations have come up down near the end of time out of a sparsely populated area with a division of power without kings, like a lamb, representing the principles of Jesus Christ, separating the things of Caesar from the things of God, and eventually uh, becoming a superpower capable of enforcing something in an hour of desperation upon the inhabitants of the entire world. When I was at the Pentagon, I looked at this crowd. I built this case. I put my points on the screen, and then I looked at Chaplain Broom, and I looked at people that had their military uh, brass on, a very earnest crowd that uh, they were following, following along with their Bibles. And I looked at them and I said, how many nations fit this prophetic description? And then I said, there's only one, uh, you know, Tiger Woods, he, he's famous as a golfer, and there's only one Tiger Woods in this world in spite of his moral problems. I mean, people know who he is, and when they see him on the golf course, it's him. And the fact is that when you look at the prophecy and you look at the points, there's only one nation that fits this prophetic scenario, and that is the United States of America. I challenge you to find any other nation that fits every single point of the prophecy, 
except for this country. And when I mentioned this to this crowd, uh, they looked at me and they, they nodded their heads. They said, wow, we've never understood this before, but we can see it right in the Bible. I'm glad that I'm an American. I love this country. Uh, I appreciate so many of its values. Uh, when I travel overseas, I'm thrilled to get back. Uh, I, I know that in spite of our problems, uh, on every coin it says, in God we trust. Our national pledge of allegiance, when we put our right hand over our hearts, we still say, uh, with liberty and justice for all, one nation under God. And I believe that God has blessed America. Uh, God has been with this country in spite of its faults, in spite of its problems. But I also believe this book, and I know, and I'm sorry to tell you, but it is true, uh, that there are dark days ahead, that this, the prophecy predicts that this great nation in the final moments of time will eventually yield to pressure. It will yield to the pressures of the devil himself, and it will sacrifice and deny its principles of freedom and it will be involved in the enforcement of the mark of the beast. That's what Bible prophecy predicts is the future of this country. And when that time finally comes, when the two horns like a lamb break down and this country speaks like a dragon, then we'll have to make a choice. Everybody will have to make a choice. Are we going to follow the true lamb, Jesus Christ? Or are we going to follow the dragon, which represent, represents the devil, and submit to his authority? Who will you serve? during the final moments of time. Who will you follow? Whose side will you be on? Will it be the side of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, or will it, will it be on the side of the dragon, who is the devil, who is Lucifer, who is trying to destroy everyone who will follow him? May God help us all that when everything goes crazy, that we will follow the Lamb and reject the dragon's voice. You have just heard his voice today. We hope you've enjoyed this timely message from Pastor Steve Wolberg, and we want you to know that Whitehorse Media is deeply committed to bringing you many more simple messages straight from the Bible, designed to educate the mind, inspire the heart, and help bring our viewers and their families closer to God. To learn more about Whitehorse Media, or to watch more of Pastor Steve's television programs online, including his powerful new series of two-minute talks, visit hisvoicetoday.com. That's hisvoicetoday.com. If you have any prayer requests, you can email them to us at prayerrequests at hisvoicetoday.com. If you would like a free copy of Steve Wolberg's audio CD, Behold a White Horse, you can call us at 1-800-78-BIBLE. That's 1-800-78-BIBLE. We hope you will join us next time for another inspiring His Voice Today presentation with Steve Wolberg.